Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope you all can hear me. Please uh, flag if you don't hear me, otherwise I'll be just talking to myself. I assume that it's okay, then uh, you all can hear me. Welcome back to uh, Turbo Machinery course. Um, my name is uh, Vera Popovich, and in the next two lectures, I will be with you guys uh, covering aspects on uh, mechanical and materials aspects. Um, you see at the bottom here my email. So if you have some questions after the lecture, especially those that are not present in, in person today, so feel free to email me. Uh, I hear there's someone is unmuted. Can you please mute yourself unless you have some questions? Um, as I already mentioned, I will be uh, covering two lectures, so today and on Tuesday uh, with you. And I will also try to make sure that at the end of the second lecture, we have some time to go over the assignments. As you know, there's um, an assignment for this course. There are four assignments, which, one of which will be on uh, materials aspects. Uh, so I'll try to put aside some five minutes to, to make sure that if you have some questions on this assignment, uh, you can ask and you understand uh, what it's all about. The assignment is about 10% uh, of your grade, um, and I'll give more details in the next lecture. Um, what I'm going to cover uh, with you guys is, uh, uh, in, hopefully in this lecture, we'll try to, to split to first look into materials. So what are materials, what kind of materials are used for high temperature applications? Yes, yeah, so for, for turbo machinery, uh, what new materials, new, new concepts are um, I applied and used and I dedicate uh, a few slides to the concepts of um, rapid prototyping of uh, additive manufacturing. Um, and uh, towards the end uh, of this lecture, if time is left, We'll briefly look into thermal barrier coatings. Um, so this is what I hope we'll uh, will cover today. Um, in the next lecture on Tuesday, we'll try to dive more in depth into uh, into the mechanical aspects, so into uh, most relevant uh, failure mechanisms and that has been uh, creep and uh, high temperature fatigue. Um, and we'll see how far we'll, we'll, we'll progress with this. Before I go uh, more in depth into lecture, you see my picture here. Well, you also probably see a video of me. Normally, for sure, we'll, we will be in the class, so there is no need for that. Um, I am not from the same department as uh, Sika Klein. I'm from the Department of Material Science and Engineering, and uh, I'm an associate professor here, and I specialize in mechanical behavior of materials, specifically additively manufactured materials. Uh, so if, if you have in future more questions about uh, these aspects you can also ask. Um, next to this lecture that's, uh, that will be recorded and that's something that I just want to mention to you guys since we are having this kind of interactive online um, uh, lecturing. Uh, there are also some lectures that are available on Collegerama, that's an extra. Uh, because those lectures are uh, on my other course, but uh, at least the first three lectures, they, they cover similar concepts, yes? So they are uh, also on materials and more specifically diving into creep. Um, some, uh, there is also a lecture that's dedicated to high temperature fatigue. And for those of you who wants to know more, uh, there are three lectures on uh, thermomechanic fatigue. This will not be covered in this course, so that's why I'm putting this as like an extra. But uh, just for your background, if you are interested, you can also um, go ahead and visit this. Um, I'll put this uh, on, uh, on the bright space for you as well, uh, so you can follow the links uh, later on. I don't know how it works. For our students, it's not a problem, but I don't know whether uh, those of you from industry also have access to college drama. So that's, that's something maybe we can see if it can be arranged for you. Um, the, the way the style of my lectures uh, is, well, normally in the class is different for sure, we use the board, uh, but here you will see uh, the slides. So normally I would upload the slides and they're already on the Brightspace. Uh, 
where you see that besides the, the slide itself, what, what, what we see here now in the screen, there's also notes at the bottom. Yeah, and uh, I use this notes, especially for you, for students, to, to summarize the, the main, the general uh, information that's, uh, that is required for this specific slide. Um, besides the notes and the lectures, there is also a reader uh, in, uh, in, on the Brightspace uploaded. Uh, under the books, I believe, uh, and it's uh, covering aspects of what we're going to cover with you, so materials and more specifically uh, creep and uh, prediction of life uh, with creep. So feel free also to, uh, to go see, uh, see that. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, go directly into uh, the first uh, uh, part for the day lecture, and that is uh, related to materials, uh, materials for high temperature applications. Um, and I, I normally like to start that uh, yeah, for high temperature applications for sure, not only uh, in, in aircrafts or in engines, uh, but it's, it's also relevant for, uh, for power plants, for oil refineries, yeah, for chemical plants. If you look into, um, into engines, uh, the temperatures can reach up to 1400 degrees and will uh, look more into uh, the range of temperatures and uh, range of pressures that uh, that materials can experience. If you look into steam turbine power plants, so the, the pipes that carry the steam, uh, also uh, 560 degrees high pressure that can be reached, and some more extreme application, maybe something for, uh, for Elon Musk that they're dealing not so much for us, is uh, Apollo, yeah? the, the surface reentry temperatures can reach up to 2,800 degrees C. So those are clearly very extreme temperatures. And uh, we will see that besides the temperatures, there are other um, extreme environmental boundary conditions that are imposed on, uh, on materials, which means that we have to uh, be aware of what are the limitations for materials and account for those. Um, before I dive into uh, to example of materials that are used in, in engines, I always like to give uh, some examples of already for, for motivation of relevant mechanisms. And uh, here on this slide, uh, you can see, uh, let me just close the window because I can see a lot of screens. I'm sorry, this slide. Um, you can see um, a steam power, uh, uh, power generator uh, and uh, it's been in, in exploitation for about uh, 17 years uh, under temperature of 540 degrees C. But what was uh, more relevant uh, for this is that it's been experiencing about 2000 stop start cycles. Yeah, so kind of experiencing a fatigue loading. And what happens uh, in this particular uh, case is that a crack uh, initiated in six section of turbine casing. So it uh, due to this specific uh, uh, start stop accumulation. Yeah, so it's uh, it's the most dangerous when you have this transients between 150 and 200 degrees in, in this particular case uh, between the steam admission valves um, and the fatigue crack in this particular case due to this transients thermal transients is initiated. But what is important to keep in mind is that uh, the fatigue, the initiation of the fatigue crack is not enough just for the complete failure. Um, in this case, it was found that it's actually a combination of fatigue and uh, creep. So the, uh, the creep aspect we are going to, to look into, uh, but the crack actually advanced subcritically uh, due to creep that uh, because this uh, power generator operated under high temperature for a prolonged time, 17 years, um, and it's experiencing um, steady load and the steady load uh, a creep uh, deformation. So the, the crack uh, further propagated and uh, resulted in a, in a failure in this particular case. Yeah? So what to uh, keep in mind that uh, it's uh, in a lot of high temperature application, it's not just one failure mechanism, but it's a combination. So in this particular case, it's fatigue and creep, but uh, quite often we are also looking into uh, oxidation. So high temperature oxidation on top of that. 
Uh, and more as I come uh, from materials department, we for sure like to look inside the materials and design the materials for specific resistance. And in this particular case, where you see is um, this uh, left hand side image, you see a cross section of, of that crack. Yeah, so that's uh, what we call this intergranular creep cracks along uh, the grain boundaries. Um, and uh, yeah, this cross section for sure to reveal this, uh, it's been polished and etched. Uh, and you see uh, a very distinct uh, creep crack along the grain boundaries. Uh, and you also can see a fracture surface on the right hand side. So this is a creep cavities uh, on the grain boundaries that are uh, perpendicular on the applied tensile axis, yeah, in this particular case. We will look more uh, during the, our creep, if we have enough time, more into what kind of uh, fracture appearances uh, when you look inside material you can have. Um, what is also important to note it, uh, in here is that compared to the virgin material, so the material that uh, didn't experience uh, this kind of uh, prolonged, uh, so in this case, about 17 years after uh, 540 degrees C uh, exploitation, so the lifetime reduced by three to five times. So that's to give you an order of magnitude how this kind of uh, exploitation conditions uh, can reduce the lifetime. So when we deal, uh, and this is I, normally when I'm in the class, uh, I ask the students and we like to have it in a more interactive way. Uh, when we deal with high temperature uh, applications, uh, I like to ask, so when we increase the temperature, what do you think happens with the material? Uh, and uh, in with this respect, uh, what would you like to have in the material to have them for high temperature, to, to apply them for high temperature applications? Um, and I'm still trying to figure out how, how to do this in, in Zoom to make it more interactive. Uh, we can use maybe a, a chat function, yeah, so for you guys that especially have uh, questions uh, uh, during the lecture, after the lecture. Um, so let's, let's see along the way how it's, how it's going to work uh, with, with this group with you. So when we look into the materials, so we uh, in materials for sure look like to look into uh, the movements of atoms or dislocations. Uh, when the temperature increase, um, atoms start moving faster. So that's why we also say that high temperature creep, for example, is uh, is a diffusion control process, and this definitely affects mechanical properties. So we have a greater mobility of dislocations, uh, also increased amount of vacancies that are formed, and we have deformation along the grain boundaries. You have uh, in, in creep, and we will look into creep mechanisms, quite often you look into deformation along the grain boundaries. Uh, uh, next to this, what often happens, and uh, a lot of, uh, I see, especially uh, mechanical engineers forget, so without the materials background, that at high temperature, especially prolonged high temperature, uh, metallurgical changes can take place. Uh, that being uh, phase transformation, but that also can be recrystallization of grains, uh, precipitation of certain phases, uh, or definitely oxidation. Yeah, that is quite often and uh, can be very detrimental. So with this respect, when we uh, do look into high temperature materials, uh, lois, uh, we need for sure to look into two aspects that uh, they have improved high temperature strengths. Um, and uh, we will look into fatigue strengths, but also into, into creep resistance. Um, and for sure, it was important to remember that they also have a good oxidation resistance, uh, the, the, especially metallic layers. Okay. Uh, Let's see, uh, thus far, you guys probably, uh, your background might be quite different, but I think some of you are uh, mechanical engineers here. So thus far, you probably look, looked into, uh, and you have knowledge about the uh, instantaneous time independent uh, failure in the materials, yeah? So you looked into uh, elastic and plastic deformation under the applied load. Um, but the question is, uh, what happens to, to this kind of uh, domain, 
uh, when you test your materials so the strengths under the elevated temperature. And what uh, happens, what we call is that uh, we need to add a third domain yeah, to this uh, stress. Strain is, uh, it's, uh, the strength becomes strain rate or time dependence. Yeah? So it depends on the exposure of time. And, um, and we call this in very general terms is a, a script. It's a time dependent deformation under a certain, uh, certain applied load. It doesn't necessarily need to be uh, a specific load that is applied on the material. Yeah, it can even be the load uh, of the, due to the weight of the component. And um, uh, for sure, this kind of addition of time dependence uh, next to stress strain uh, requires reformulation of uh, stress strain time uh, relations. And uh, for us, for, for engineers, but especially also for material scientists, we see that it opens um, 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 a very interesting domain to, to look into. Yeah? So there is a lot of research that uh, looks at, at high temperature time dependent deformation. When I said that uh, most of you are familiar with instantaneous uh, time independent deformation, that's probably not entirely true. And some of you uh, may have maybe corrected me because you might know that um, the, the strands uh, has a dependency on, on, on temperature, yeah, and it also has a dependency on strain rate. Let's see if there is a check. Um, creep, this is something that we are going to, uh, to cover with you guys. Uh, so it's uh, the, in the next lecture. So it's uh, under applied load indeed. So you apply a stress and normally under the static uh, stress, but quite often in engineering application for sure, uh, you don't have only the static application, stat static load. And what we see in, uh, in engines, for example, it's a combination of creep and fatigue. Yeah, so creep and high temperature fatigue. So it's uh, much more complex, but we are going to, to look into uh, uh, in the next lecture, if time allows, uh, how this uh, combination of creep and fatigue looks like. Yeah, so there are certain formulations uh, that can be accounted for. Um, let's see. Uh, creep itself, the creep mechanism is important for sure, not only for metals, but also for ceramics. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you, Luca. Um, there is definitely a difference between creep and fatigue, and we are going to cover this in the next lecture. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in today's lecture, let's focus on materials, and, and in the next lecture, we'll introduce creep, creep mechanisms, so diffusion control and so on, and uh, also we'll dive into more um, cyclic uh, loading, so high cycle and low cycle fatigue. We'll, we'll cover that with you guys. We'll try to cover this with you in the next lecture. Let's see if we can move to the next slide, if it works. Yeah. Um, so for now, what, uh, what I'm introducing to you guys is uh, the creep with respect to, in, in general, just examples on the material. And uh, here, I like to show a very visual example of uh, creep in uh, lead pipes. And in, uh, since pre-Roman time, the lead has been used uh, for water conducts yeah, and also for roofing. Um, and in England, uh, it's also called soft lead for these purposes is used and the reason because it has excellent weldability, formability, yeah, it's uh, also sound absorbing uh, properties, uh, but there is a problem, well, the, besides the creep, there are other problems for sure with this, uh, with lead uh, that you wouldn't want to use for water conduction. Uh, but what we observe is that uh, uh, lead tends to creep at a very alarming rate already above 50 degrees C. So when we say that uh, quite often uh, we see the definition of creep that is a permanent plastic deformation of materials under the high temperature, that's not entirely true. And this is an example that um, even at, uh, at room temperature, in this particular case, it's uh, 
at, uh, at the environment's uh, temperature. Uh, after 75 years, uh, the lead pipe uh, resulted in sagging yeah, at room temperature, and you see this kind of uh, permanent plastic uh, deformation. Uh, here, when we talk about the creep, and we'll, we'll dive into this concept of uh, temperature, um, uh, that there is important for creep to consider. In general, we say that for crystalline materials, creep is important, so uh, above 0.3 of melting temperature. Yeah, so 0.3 multiply melting temperature is important. So for example, for nickel alloys, uh, it depends on the alloy. Um, it's already become uh, the melt uh, alarming above 900 degrees, but it depends on the alloy. So we'll see that there are uh, super alloys uh, which are more resistant than the others. For ceramics, um, it's a bit uh, different. So it's 0.4 to 0.5 melting temperature. So for example, for alumina, so aluminum oxide, it's, uh, it's close to 1,000 uh, degrees. Uh, that's uh, creep should already be considered. So this was uh, just a general to give you insights, uh, guys, into, um, into example, yeah, into interaction. And now I'm going to dive into, uh, well, for this specific course for engine. And uh, I'm sure that uh, by now you, you are much more of an expert in engine and the different type of engines. Uh, I will uh, approach it from the perspective of materials that they used and type of um, deterioration mechanisms that they can experience. So here on the slide, you see an example of uh, aircraft engine Airbus A380. Um, and you see different type of materials that they use. But before we dive into this, uh, just a reminder, I think you, you probably covered that already, that uh, in order to, to fly for an engine, uh, to take off or to land, uh, the aircraft needs uh, a jet engine with sufficient uh, propulsion power. Yeah? And uh, you see that, uh, that jet engines, they create forward uh, thrust by taking a large amount of air uh, and see mouse and discharging it at the high speeds of uh, jet of a gas. Yeah? Um, here you see for this purpose, there are three sections and they experience these three sections, they experience different exploitation uh, boundary conditions. And as a result, they also have different uh, design and materials that they use there. So uh, Quite often uh, we see for compressor, for example, uh, here, uh, the, the compressor area, uh, you see combustion and the turbine. For sure, the most uh, uh, severe and the most extreme, extreme conditions that materials experience are in the turbine and the combustor area. And you see an example of temperature and pressure uh, that, for example, in high pressure turbine uh, uh, that is experienced. Yes, yeah? so you have a both combination of high pressure and high temperature. Uh, and that's uh, next to high uh, centrifugal forces that also, uh, for example, the turbine blaze uh, that are experiencing. In turbines, when we are talking about high efficiency, um, we're talking about uh, tuba entry temperature, yeah? And the tuba entry temperature can reach uh, up to 1100 degrees C. And uh, that's, as I already mentioned, next to high uh, forces, so for example, centrifugal forces. So it's uh, uh, no wonder that uh, for turbine and combustor areas, uh, in, I, see, I would say in the past uh, 20 or so, 30 years, um, a new type of nickel-based super alloys that's, uh, that's been used uh, in order to tackle high temperature strands and uh, fatigue resistance uh, for, for these specific areas. Um, in general, when we talk, for example, about the cold areas, because it's not the, the turbine for sure, not only the, the hot areas, uh, that uh, is interesting. But uh, there are also cold areas, so that is, uh, for example, fan, uh, low pressure compressor, or high pressure compressor. And we look into the mechanical design uh, of these parts, we normally talk about uh, dynamic problems. 
Yeah, so that's been uh, vibration, uh, blade vibration, uh, or as you may guess, uh, impact resistance. So impact uh, by foreign object. And quite often we see this, uh, we had recently grouped the look into simulation of bird impact on, uh, on the blade. Um, in the uh, hot parts uh, engine, so the high pressure compressor, combustion engine, high pressure turbine, uh, the, the design is mostly based on uh, creep and uh, strong mechanical fatigue. And next to this, for both uh, cold parts and hard parts, uh, again, that I need to emphasize, uh, it should not be uh, left out, is the environmental effects. Yeah? So, and uh, this should be considered in all parts, that being either corrosion uh, degradation or high temperature oxidation uh, degradation. So uh, in both aspects uh, are important uh, for, for materials. So this is uh, just an extension of the previous slide, just to give a, a few, like a zoom in, yeah, into the, into the blades and into the turbine. So for blades, we quite often see that this is a, a lightweight titanium alloy. So Ti-6-4, for example, is, um, uh, is often used. Uh, next to more and more, we see also the composite type of materials are used. Uh, for uh, turbines, and we will look in the next slide, example of turbines, this for sure nickel-based super alloys, uh, or sometimes also we see more and more um, titanium aluminides uh, or intermetallics, uh, type of intermetallics, uh, ceramics that they used for, uh, for turbine blades specifically. Uh, but there are also limitations with, uh, with this. Um, yeah, this is again a different engine, Rolls Royce, but the same example. Yeah, so it's uh, the interlet case is aluminum alloy, uh, but the inside, so it's either titanium alloy, Ti64, or nickel base uh, in canal 718, 738, so the different type of 650, different type of uh, nickel base in canal uh, alloys. And now my favorite part here is the turbine blades. And it's one of the most, um, or at least my group is focusing on this uh, part a lot in terms of manufacturing, but also in terms of materials design for turbine blades. And uh, we see that, uh, that the turbine blades and some of you that come especially from industry, probably you're familiar. Uh, with this. This is a rotating uh, components in a, in a turbine, uh, which presents uh, many challenges for mechanical engineers, uh, for designers, but also for us, for material scientists. Uh, uh, it's, the turbine blade is in general responsible for uh, extracting energy from the high temperatures so or high pressure gas produced by the combustor. Um, and it's very often we see this is one of the most limiting components um, in, the, in the engine itself. Uh, and to survive uh, extreme conditions, extreme uh, operating boundary uh, conditions, uh, we see very exotic materials at the SDS uh, proposed. Uh, an example on the slide, you can see uh, the type of failure that's, uh, that's yeah, in environmental and failure modes that the turbine blades can experience. Uh, really high temperatures, that depends on the engine, but they can reach up to 15, 1600 degrees C, high stresses, centrifugal fluid forces, and environment of high vibration and uh, corrosion. Quite often we see uh, this is a kind of sulfide degradation, corrosion oxidation that take place. And on your uh, right top image, you see a turbine blade that is cracked due to, to creep. Uh, but uh, for creep, quite often uh, we see uh, the, failure, the failure analysts, uh, they always find that something initiates the crack, yeah? And quite often it's either fatigue uh, crack or in the recent cases of some uh, failure of, uh, of aircrafts, 
this is related to sulfide corrosion or oxidation on the surface. And that's why, as you will see, we will see later on, these uh, turbine blades, uh, they are coated, so they have a thermal barrier coating uh, among the temperature protection, for sure, it's also to, to address the, uh, the oxidation and corrosion resistance of, of the material. Um, what we see here is um, also uh, the, the design, and you, there is a link, it's, it's a weak link, but you can find a, a lot of different designs in uh, over turbine blades. Uh, so they, they're very complex, yeah? So what you see is uh, besides the shape itself, for sure, you, um, there are, these days they're very intricate cooling channels. And uh, one of the reasons actually why uh, there's this additive manufacturing, so rapid prototyping is being proposed for, uh, for engines and for spe specifically for turbine blades is, uh, is because of this uh, flexibility in the design of cooling channel or design of, of, uh, of the entire blade, uh, which is almost unlimited with, uh, uh, with rapid prototype and additive manufacturing technologies compared to conventional techniques. But I will dive into this uh, uh, in a few slides. Uh, uh, later on. So when we talk about high centrifugal forces, they are, they've been mentioned already on a few occasions. We are for sure when the blade rotates, and most of you, I think, are uh, mechanical engineers here, uh, so you should be familiar with the concept of centrifugal forces. Um, they rotate, uh, this blade rotates uh, tens of thousands of revolutions per minute, yeah? so really high RPM, and that's next to the fluid forces which uh, cause uh, fracture yielding and uh, well, this high temperature for sure also create. Let's see, uh, if I'm trying to see if I need to cover something with you guys here. Um, uh, on this slides is uh, again a gas turbine for electric power generator. Um, I'm not gonna, I think all the areas, this is something that I hope you cover also in the other lectures. Uh, for my purpose, we would like to give you an example of uh, material lifetime uh, here. Yeah, so the base material, normally when we talk about, for example, the turbine blades, um, you're talking about 10 to the power of five operation lifetime. So uh, when we test components, when we test materials, uh, we do not uh, put tests that, uh, let's say, for steam power plants or so that need to, to survive a decade. Yeah? So we look into uh, more for creep uh, test that we call uh, a rupture test, uh, it's a faster test. Yeah? And then we use, uh, as we will see in, in the next lecture, we use extrapolation procedures to estimate uh, total lifetime. So with this, you can see a, a general order of magnitude, the base material, the coating lifetime, and the, the total uh, rotor lifetime of the component uh, that can be also well, simulated and predicted. Um, in gas turbines, uh, and so this is also comes for, uh, actually also for, for aerospace applications, um, we see, uh, the, the, for example, the turbine blades, as I already mentioned, uh, that's uh, normally ma made from a complex uh, nickel-based alloys. Uh, so we'll, look, we'll dive into what I like to, to call a cookbook of alloys. You see a lot of different elements that are added there. Uh, each one of them added for a specific purpose. Uh, and you see for high temperature areas, those are mostly nickel, nickel chromium, so nickel based super alloys. Yeah, with, uh, uh, with the new generation of super alloys, uh, it's a relatively high amounts of rare earth elements, as you can see at the, at the end here. For, uh, for compressor, and uh, normally it's uh, TIE 6 4 and I use, but they're up to a certain temperature, so up to 400, 450 degrees. Um, it's there for sure due to their lightweight and uh, hastelloy often you see the hastelloy also uh, 
in the turbines uh, being mentioned, another example of uh, nickel chromium uh, superalloy. Let's see, uh, this is an example of um, uh, turbine engine development. So you see here a specific fuel consumption, yeah, and uh, the takeoff trust. So you see that um, the development of, of materials and the designs over the years, so since, since 50, been focused on the reducing for sure the fuel consumption that uh, goes in line with the reduction in the, in the weight. Uh, uh, and thrust and uh, resulting in the increase of takeoffs. You see a different type of, from goals to trend. Uh, well, this figure should be now updated for sure that we are now in 2020. So there are new ranges uh, that's been developed, but you see a general trend, general idea behind the design. And uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, the efficiency, uh, of, of the engines since, I would say, since 50s, uh, 60s, uh, been focused on the, the TAT temperature, but uh, the materials development uh, been one, was one of the key drivers to improve the efficiency. Yeah, so not just the design, but uh, the type of materials that they used, uh, or type of uh, coatings that can be used next to these materials, they were uh, the driving factors. Uh, so just to sum up for, for you guys, uh, what type of conditions and materials requirements uh, uh, that they used and, uh, and we, we can get uh, a question on your exam, for example, to outline what are uh, general problems with, uh, with the materials can experience and uh, what kind of, uh, for example, solutions can be proposed to, to tackle creep in a certain material. Yeah? So um, keep an eye on that. Um, so operating conditions, uh, for sure, high temperature and high pressure, what we mentioned, uh, are dynamic forces, uh, cyclic, uh, mechanical and thermal loading, something that uh, I think we will not be able to dive into, uh, but when we are dealing with uh, a high temperature application, especially in engines, uh, during the uh, start, uh, so takeoff and landing, you have to start and shut down uh, of engines, uh, the material experience high uh, thermal loading. So next to the uh, strain amplitude, yes, yeah, so or, or, or stresses, the fluctuating stresses, what we call a, a fatigue, the range of stress, uh, the material is also experiencing a range of, uh, of temperature. So that's what we, we call a thermomechanic fatigue. Uh, we will not cover in, in this course because we have only two lectures for you guys. But as I said, there is an extra on um, on Collegiorama, if you're interested, you, you can have a look because I think uh, it's an interesting concept to also be aware of. Uh, oxidation and aggressive environments. I mentioned to you that uh, not only the, the conventional oxidation, but that's also something like, for example, uh, the sulfides, yeah, the sulfides, uh, the de degradation, uh, corrosion degradation due to some sulfides calcium, magnesium, alumina, silicates. Yeah, so this kind of uh, degradation mechanisms in aggressive environments are common. Erosion, erosion for uh, so degradation by a foreign object. And th this gives us a range of materials behavior that needs to be accounted for. Uh, normally the first, I would say the first four uh, is something that uh, is, is really very conventional to, to look into and consider. So, so fracture, so fracture resistance, especially uh, impact resistance, creep, fatigue, and high temperature oxidation. So hard corrosion and, and uh, erosion, uh, this is uh, uh, another very interesting aspect uh, uh, in, in, on the materials and degradation in the materials. And uh, for those of you also that would like to dive more into it, uh, we have in uh, quarter four, uh, one of my courses, Materials at High Temperature, where we cover high temperature corrosion, oxidation, and erosion as well. Yeah? So this is uh, extra degradation mechanisms in the materials. Uh, so conditions that, and materials requirements, um, high temperature resistance, so quite often uh, 
for sure you 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 would not even consider using uh, aluminium for example yes yeah? so you need to look into high temperature resistant materials for uh, certain um, areas in your engine uh, you have to be strong so yield strength and tough although uh, with toughness you should be uh, for sure critical uh, because uh, often we see that uh, blades these days are proposed like uh, ceramics, for example, or intermetallics. The uh, well, you should you should know for sure that they are not as ductile, so they are not as uh, their toughness is not high compared to metals. But not all areas, not uh, in, in the engines, require high toughness resistance. Yeah. So if there is no danger of uh, uh, of impact of a certain object or something, uh, then a different threshold of toughness can be put uh, upon that material. Uh, thermal shock resistance, so that's again, uh, the material should be able to resist uh, a thermal shock. Yeah? Quite often uh, we see going uh, from, let's say, anywhere between minus 50 to really extreme high temperatures. So this is a really high uh, thermal loading, gradient in loading, uh, high corrosion resistance and erosion. And in most and a lot of these applications, uh, the use of coatings is required to meet uh, this require, uh, these conditions, especially with respect to high temperature corrosion erosion resistance. And that's where the thermal barrier coatings are uh, used, uh, became um, very conventional. Uh, another aspect in for our uh, 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 IRA engine is that's for sure when we look into strengths or design of engines, uh, uh, we will not look just into to strengths, we will look into properties, to specific properties with respect to density. Yes, yeah? so when we look into selection of materials, we look into specific, uh, specific strengths to specific properties. And that's for sure to address uh, the, the aspect of weight. Um, here you see an interesting uh, another example of uh, low strength and uh, besides this the, the high temperature resistance uh, in terms of strength so you see the tensile strength with respect to the temperature yeah so aluminium alloys is definitely uh, well it's light yeah so that's a, a good uh, example so it could be used for casing uh, but uh, it's not really high temperature resistant. You can see a very sharp degradation in strength with, uh, with temperature. Uh, uh, with titanium alloys, it's somewhat better, so it's shifted to higher temperatures. Uh, the density goes a bit higher, uh, but the advantage of nickel-based super alloys uh, is that this transition in temperature is not as abrupt, yeah? So the in transition in, in dependence of tensile strength and temperature. And uh, it's, uh, it's for sure better for high temperature applications, it's more predictable. But uh, this is to the sacrifice of weight. So you see that uh, the weight is uh, twice that of titanium alloys and uh, it's even higher than the aluminum alloys. Yeah? So this is just to give you uh, uh, an example uh, of, uh, yeah of why this is used. To finish uh, off uh, before the break uh, with the message into, into basically how this all uh, research in materials uh, took off, uh, there is a quote from uh, 1940, so already the last century, uh, from Sir Frank uh, Whittle. And uh, it basically says that with the present internal combustion engine equipment uh, used in, in current airspace weight about 1.1 1 to 1 .1 pound per horsepower. Uh, and to approach such a figure with gas turbine seems beyond the realm of possibility with existing materials. So what, uh, what Sir Frank was saying that, well, actually it's, it's not gonna be possible. What, what we now see with gas turbines he was saying that it's not it's not possible with the uh, with that with the technology back then and with the especially with the material uh, that they used back then and this is uh, more or less 50s 60s uh, 
when this whole research took off, but also for sure there was much more uh, understanding on um, uh, more developments and more uh, ASTM or standards started uh, looking into aerospace and uh, high temperature application and failure of materials. Yeah? And that also kicked uh, the development of materials. With this, I suggest we take a, a break with you guys. We resume at, uh, at 9.45 and I will then dive more into nickel by superalloys, what's inside there and uh, what kind of cookbook we use to, to develop it. Okay, let's see if I can do something. Okay, I hope everyone is back after the break. Let's resume where we left off. And uh, just before the break, we uh, discussed, uh, well, we actually stopped on this slide, uh, uh, which is the motivation for uh, further looking in, in new materials or developing new materials back in 1940s. And uh, that actually what brings me to the next slide, which, uh, shows uh, over the years, yeah, and also projected how it's going to look like, um, what can be done in terms of uh, the materials as, as a key drive for development of, uh, of turbines and efficiency in turbines. Uh, if we look into uh, 1940s, what type of materials and, and specifically uh, what type of the processes were used. They were mostly uh, road-based, so not cast uh, materials, yeah. And as we will see later on, uh, they had very uh, specific uh, grain structure yeah, that were not really favorable for properties like creep. Um, later on, uh, more uh, developments took place towards uh, conventionally cast and more towards directionally solidified alloys. And in the next slide, I will show you guys what we mean by directional solidification. And uh, some of you might already guess why this directional solidification. And later on, what we see now is uh, single crystal alloys, uh, nickel-based alloys especially, are, are used uh, these days uh, in the engines, in turbine blades, for example. And if we look in already in this century, in, in 2010, uh, from 2000s, that's for sure was uh, uh, the age from mid 90s, let's say, when the thermal barrier coatings were applied and pushed even further um, the capabilities, the possibilities of, um, uh, of current materials, because with, uh, with the application of thermal barrier coatings, we will see they can be different ones but you can push uh, the temperature inside the material, inside the bulk, so what, inside the turbine blade, for example, up to 150, 200 degrees. And uh, that for sure uh, allows, uh, gives a lot of room uh, also in terms of the efficiency. If we look at the new target, what these days are being developed uh, is, uh, and looked into is for sure the ceramic, ceramic matrix composite materials uh, as new materials that are uh, looked, uh, they are lighter, uh, they can experience higher temperatures, but uh, with a lot of this uh, depends on the ceramic matrix composite for sure how it reinforced. Um, toughness and, uh, and brittleness is an issue. Yeah, Next to, next to that, uh, with ceramic, the current uh, problem uh, is shaping it in because uh, 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 forming the ceramics is tricky and machining especially is tricky. Uh, what we see is uh, lately, for example, GE, General Electrics, they came up with uh, uh, all 3D printed uh, engine and they, they claim that it's, it's been tested and then can fly. Uh, but the turbine blades there, they were, for example, pro produced from intermetallics. So they are looking into already lighter uh, uh, blades or lighter materials there. 
And that was produced with additive manufacturing, which allows for sure the design flexibility and shape. But uh, it's, there are a lot of uh, um, problems with that as well. Um, I promise you guys to look into to grain structure. Yeah, so it's uh, when we look into the materials besides the chemistry, what is important is uh, uh, how the structure of the material look like. Uh, if back in, let's say, 50s, uh, uh, the materials were produced with conventional casting or even road materials, uh, the grain structure was mostly acquiesced. Yeah, okay. so as you can see this uh, relatively small grains and equiax. And for creep resistance, uh, this is not the structure that you would like to have in your material because creep mechanism is, we will cover in the next uh, uh, slide, it's accompanied by grain boundary sliding. So the more grain boundaries you have, the more deformation and possibilities for sliding there are. So the more, uh, the, the more permanent deformation your material can experience among other things for sure. So that's why um, uh, next to uh, actually looking into complicated uh, chemistries, uh, uh, a lot of research as we will see in the next slide, a lot of research in the especially 50s, 60s were focused on things that would address the grain boundaries. So how to strengthen the grain boundaries, what kind of precipitates we should have not to have the sliding. But uh, since appro uh, approximately 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. the approach moved from uh, looking into very, very complex uh, chemistry, yeah, so the, the cookbook, uh, and more into what kind of processing technologies can be used to, to address this. And one of these routes was um, looking into uh, directionally solidified structures. Uh, so the, the molds are used and the grains are a grown directionally in a specific uh, 001 direction. And uh, the 001 direction is preferred because it has 40% uh, lower Young's modules you know, because mat uh, uh, materials, so the, the elastic properties Young's modules is dependent on the crystal structure. So when you have a specific 001 orientation of the crystals, uh, the Young's modules is lower and that results in lower stresses so the, and also lower fatigue stress uh, that's, uh, that that material uh, is experiencing. So that's something that uh, was preferred. And the next move was uh, for sure to all the way to single crystal material. However, with these technologies, uh, you, you are very limited to specific shapes. Yeah, and uh, quite often only single mode or mold can be used. So it's also quite expensive. And again, no wonder why we see that uh, newer and newer technologies are coming up. And so one of those is additive manufacturing where you don't need such molds and you are where you're much more flexible, especially with respect to the cooling channels that can be used. But uh, now as a material scientist, uh, uh, we look into for sure composition into the microstructure in the material. And uh, uh, what is important for you guys to know is uh, for nickel-based uh, superalloys, so the composition of superalloy substrate. And uh, it's designed, has been historically designed to, to, to resist high temperatures, so to have high, st high strength at high temperature. Uh, or to have a more smooth deterioration of temperature, yeah, with, uh, of strength with temperature, and uh, high creep resistance. Uh, when we talk about nickel-based superalloys, you normally talk, uh, you normally have a, a gamma as a matrix and gamma prime, uh, which is uh, a nickel three with a certain. It's either aluminium or niobium. It depends uh, what kind of um, uh, partitioning into gamma prime you have. Uh, so in a lot of like, for example, uh, in canal 718, you will have a gamma prime as uh, uh, nickel-3 niobium. Yeah? So it depends on the loin elements that, that they used. So all uh, different elements, it's a cookbook that are added for specific purpose. So partitioning, partitioning to gamma prime, um, it's zirconium and hafnium are carbide formers. And um, uh, lately what we see is uh, 
already mentioned, this, uh, this rare earth elements, uh, such as rhenium, for example, uh, they've been used to strongly promote uh, high temperature properties, uh, nickel-based uh, superalloys. This is just a, a summary for you guys. And uh, I have a question from someone. Yeah, uh, it's a good question, additive manufacturing. I have a few slides later on. Uh, this is an ongoing development uh, to produce with additive manufacturing single crystals. So we see with uh, uh, there are a few technologies that are used to grow on it. Uh, they are either uh, laser based or electron beam. So with electron beam, there are success stories. So you can uh, zero, zero, 001 crystals can be grown. Uh, they are, we saw the JG uh, and uh, lately published uh, on that. Um, in our group, what we focused is more on combination of uh, uh, columnar grains, so 001 uh, grains, yeah? Um, and in the next few slides, I will show you examples what kind of grains we can grow with, with additive manufacturing, how we can control this. But a short answer is, uh, uh, the ones that I've seen is, is related to the uh, heat conduction, yeah, so the heat dissipation and the direction of heat dissipation, and that's how the grains will be grown, yeah, in, 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 your, in additive manufacturing, because it's a layer-wise technique. You, you, you put it layer by layer, uh, your powder, or depends on the filament you're using. Uh, so it depends on the heat dissipation, so most common is 001 orientation, which is most preferred for uh, for high temperature application, uh, especially for fatigue because of uh, lower Young's modules in this direction of, of the grain. Uh, I hope this answers your question because in the next few slides, as I said, I'll, I'll show you a few more examples in additive manufacturing. Um, in, let's see, uh, another question. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm a little bit slow with the chat and uh, answers. So, uh, be patient with me. Um, with here on the slides, as I said, is, is just a summary of the cookbook, uh, so-called cookbook of nickel-based superalloys and um, different type of uh, constituents, uh, elements that are used to enhance, for example, uh, solution uh, uh, properties. Uh, it could be precipitates, it could be carbide formers, uh, it could be uh, grain boundaries stabilizers or pre-surface stabilizers. Um, and all of these bulk terms, what you can see here, those are the factors that they used to affect, for example, creep strain rate, uh, creep fracture, or high temperature corrosion. Yeah? So all of these are added for specific purpose. Um, and we see that uh, as a result, the composition, that's why we call it a cookbook, is very complex of this laws, and, and no wonder we're imagining that uh, in, in the past uh, 10, 15 years, there's more and more focus uh, less on the composition and more into the technologies that can be used to tackle uh, the, the design, the cooling channel, the production, and so on. Because uh, there's been already a lot of efforts going into the, into the cookbook, uh, so to say, of the materials. Uh, See if I can move the slide. Uh, if we look into the development of nickel-based superalloys, uh, again, uh, um, a few more slides on superalloys, uh, we see that in general, modern alloys, uh, so we see the fourth generation, yes, yeah, so they've been progressing over the years. That's what I was saying, that there's been a lot of focus on developing the alloys, first, second, third generation, fourth generation, yeah? And they all uh, were, uh, for example, uh, rare earth elements, you see that they are increasing the amount of rare earth elements because they are good for high temperature properties. Um, the, uh, the concentration of uh, chromium, for example, uh, is going down while the concentration of uh, aluminum and rhenium is going up. So this is a kind of balance that you always have to tackle in, uh, to address, but in general, what we see with the uh, with the single crystal super alloys, yeah, that's 
for very high for best grid properties the single crystal are used and casting technology is still applied um, we see that uh, there is more of uh, this kind of elements yeah? so this is the, the generation the, the newer generation third generation uh, order of magnitude yes yeah? so, uh, twice more of, uh, of renew but up to six percent uh, are used in in more common nickel-based uh, for certain fourth generation. Um, let's see the question. Single, uh, so this is the uh, single crystal. Yeah, so, so this is S, SX, so it's a single crystal alloy. Uh, again, I'm very slow. Here's the chat. Um, now, why nickel-based uh, alloys and why we actually look into uh, this gamma prime precipitates? Why do we want to have a nickel-based alloys, nickel-based super alloys, this gamma prime? Because we saw that in this cookbook, a lot is made to form this gamma prime uh, precipitate. And this, in this particular case, is nickel-3 uh, aluminum, but it can be also nickel-3 niobium uh, or tantalum, for example, also depends on the alloy element. And uh, this uh, gamma prime precipitate, they are normally uh, they in the cubic uh, form because of their characteristic uh, stereographic structure. So they are, they're formed as cubes. Uh, so it's, uh, similar shapes you can find also, for example, for carbides uh, in, in this material. And uh, here you see, uh, let's see this moves. Uh, here you see a uh, nickel-based superalloy, and they are normally, this is relatively large. So this is the largest I've actually seen gamma prime. So this kind of cube in the range of uh, uh, micrometer. Normally, if you look into uh, Inconel 718, uh, 738, 650, they're in sub-micron range. And uh, this uh, kind of uh, gamma prime, uh, the uh, ordered, and it's, they have an order structure. They have a specific uh, cubic form uh, structure. And it's very difficult for dislocation. So when the dislocations want to move in the material, and, and we know that for, uh, for the deformation, uh, the, dis the dis motion dislocation is required. Um, it's difficult to move past these particles because the order will be uh, reduced. Um, and Another example of uh, what can happen in um, uh, at high temperature uh, with uh, and with application of, of stress is that uh, a kind of rafting structure is formed. So when uh, when the nickel based uh, this is a single crystal, so this is no uh, not a um, multi crystal like extra materials, a single crystal alloy. Um, and uh, the temperature is up to a thousand and a certain tensile stress is applied in a single crystal. So what happens with this kind of uh, gamma primes, they form uh, a rafting structure. Yeah, They form, they form this kind of uh, elongated plate-like um, structure. And you can imagine that when the dislocations uh, want to move, uh, it's similar to the to kind of grain boundary, so it's difficult to to pass to cut uh, through it. So what the, what is done? They're forced to cut across uh, or climb around this disrupt, and this increases the strength uh, of dislocations three to six times. This kind of effect, uh, especially when increasing the temperature from uh, from twenty to seven hundred degrees. Uh, most of you guys here are probably not material scientists, uh, so the crystal structure is of uh, less relevance for you, but when I'm just, uh, just to give, uh, to visualize this when I'm looking about the order structure, so this is an example of uh, crystal FCC structure, yeah, so gamma prime, so you have uh, aluminum at, um, at the corners and nickel inside, yeah, the structure. And this is an example that when the dislocation wants to cut, uh, it, it needs to destroy the order of, uh, of the atom position and uh, the material would, would want to restore this order and it requires a lot of energy, a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of energy from the material 
so high stress to restore the water. And uh, this is one of the reasons uh, why uh, it's difficult basically to, to cut through such uh, gamma primes. And um, when we talk uh, about nickel-based superalloys, up to 900 degrees, uh, uh, you want to have uh, gamma prime precipitates because they are the ones that strengthen uh, the matrix. But above nine, approximately 900, 950, these gamma primes, they tend to coarsen and dissolve. So for this, in the next few slides, I show you what is done to tackle that if the temperatures need to go higher. So what kind of, uh, what kind of approaches can be used there? And there we, we looked more into different type of uh, strengthening such as oxide dispersed strength and the load. So different approaches are used. Um, yeah, again, uh, guys, for you, I, I already mentioned this. Yeah, so the, the, the directional solidification uh, so the, the conventional casting columnar grains, and so I'll talk a little bit more about the columnar grains. And uh, uh, in the notes to this slide, and usually I would put it on the board, but in the notes to this slide, uh, you can have a calculation. Uh, it's, it's one zero zero uh, orientation, or if you talk about the texture of the grain, uh, it's zero zero one. Um, uh, what happens with the uh, delta sigma, so with the stress, uh, and as a result also the, the fatigue, uh, when you reduce the, the Young's modules by 40%. Yeah, so then an example is given in the notes to the slides, so you can have a look. And um, this is reason to why uh, the thermal fatigue is improved for this kind of uh, grains. Um, to give a more visual picture, so what is the implication of uh, improving or, or changing the grains uh, uh, given here? And uh, we see that uh, the temperature, uh, the service temperature, so what you see the, uh, the melt or the temperature capacity increases uh, with increasing basically the generation, the alloy generation, but also going from, from polycrystalline to columnar crystal to single crystal. And this is an example of, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so this is an example of polycrystal column and a single crystal. And for sure, this has a very direct implication uh, to the lifetime. Yeah, so you see uh, the relative lifetime. So creep, strength, thermal fatigue, and corrosion resistance. And it's really undoubted how much, you, uh, by an order of magnitude, yes, yeah, so three times uh, improvement for columnar crystals and uh, almost nine times fold improvement uh, for a single crystal world. So besides the, besides the chemistry for sure, well, it's, uh, the, the grain structure and the processing play a very crucial uh, role because you can imagine that um, in 40s, 50s or 60s, uh, a lot of effort was just on the polycrystals and how uh, the grains can be strengthened and so on. And there was not even close how much they managed to reach when we change uh, the grain structure. Yeah, so it's three times to nine times uh, fold. Uh, with this, uh, I finish more introduction into what was, uh, let's say, before. Yeah, and now I would like to, to cover with you what kind of alternative materials and alternative uh, processing routes um, there exist. And, uh, which direction uh, this all could be going. And so the first example here I give is uh, in situ composites. Um, and again, many developments were based on the, on the processing technology. And uh, plot here, it shows uh, a so-called uh, performance of eutectic super alloys, which are the solid lines here. So this, everything this in situ composites, yeah, so they, uh, they have sp specific names, yeah, so this uh, composites. So those are the solid lines uh, shown here. In uh, uh, broken lines, it shows the advanced super laws. And uh, you see the difference that uh, uh, between the two with respect the stress for rupture in uh, 1000 hours, yeah. So the composite materials, uh, they, they have more superior properties. 
um, they use unidirectional solidification of uh, eutectic alloy uh, yielding this kind of in situ composites. They normally are reinforced by high strength third particles or uh, viscous parallel to the applied stress. But this comes at the cost. Yeah, so they do have superior creep strengths but they require really slow solidification rate and uh, really high cost of time also. So that's why this kind of, you can find in the link here on the side, there is more uh, details uh, about this kind of alloys uh, composites. Uh, but as I said, it comes at a really high cost. And it's no wonder that uh, they are not, yeah, for, for, air, for, for normal uh, aircraft engines, for example, they're not uh, commonly used. Uh, the other approach that you will see, and so some of you might already be familiar, especially with repair, when, uh, when engineers are dealing with repair of, of engines, is um, especially creep repair, is hot as a static pressing approach. And, uh, for hot as a static pressing, when especially you deal with materials, uh, you, you take a certain uh, cast material, you use uh, spray atomization, so you spray it into the, in, in the form of a powder. So it's, it's a powder metallurgical route, this, this technique. Um, then you use a container that usually is, is a bit larger in the, in, in the shape to, to allow for slight changes in, uh, uh, during the high temperature application. And then you apply the hydrostatic pressing under the vacuum and high temperature. And uh, uh, this kind of technique, uh, as I already mentioned, is very commonly used to, to heal creep damages. So for example, if there's a creep damage, uh, it's, it can be used to, uh, to grind those parts uh, uh, and then heal it again, yeah? Or to, when there's a certain uh, crack, to apply a pressure to, uh, to heal the crack, uh, to heal the especially the, the creep crack. On the slide here, uh, you see another application of this uh, powder metallurgical route, so after hip, and uh, you see um, astro alloy, so it's a super alloy, cobalt based, cobalt chromium based uh, super alloy. And you have uh, here a cubic shape. So this again, remember it's a cubic shape uh, gamma prime. And you have uh, barites and carbides that are decorating the, uh, the form of powder boundaries. Uh, this kind of technologies, the hot is aesthetic uh, pressing and uh, powder metallurgical routes in general are quite commonly used for more exotic materials that especially are strengthened with oxides. Uh, with uh, oxide dispersed transfer materials. And that I will show you in a few slides with what this kind of ODS oxide dispersed transfer materials are. Uh, in, uh, in the next uh, three to four slides, I will give you examples because I saw also that uh, in the previous year and actually in the previous years, I would actually bring you these components, 3D printing components so that you can touch it yourself. But uh, we we'll have to do now uh, with, uh, with online uh, uh, lecturing. And uh, my, my next message with, the, with this uh, slide is that um, additive manufacturing these days is used. Uh, uh, a lot is used, especially for turbine blades processing. And that's where uh, my group is focusing on. Uh, so we use additive manufacturing technologies for production of uh, turbine components. So this is, this is some of, one of those is uh, turbine uh, blades. And so uh, the incentive for this, how to uh, start it is for sure that uh, uh, the casting of turbine blades, it requires very complex molds, uh, construction of these molds before each blade can be individually cast. It's complex, it's time consuming, uh, and it's a very costly procedure. And more importantly, you are limited in, in a design flexibility and also in iteration loop with respect to how the design envisioned, yeah, to what you actually have in, in the final uh, product. And it is in manufacturing, uh, it's, it's actually not new, it is manufacturing that days back to 60s, 70s, it's just in the past 
10, 15 years, it picked up again with the development of uh, hardware and software um, and more demands on our engineering applications for sure. Um, with additive manufacturing, the, the laser beam or electron beam is directed on the metal powder. So it's a layer by layer technique. And it's heated and melted together based on a cut model. Yeah, so it's uh, uh, then the laser is removed and uh, the metal cools. Uh, it can form the 3D uh, shapes, so the very complicated, almost unlimited in the design. And it can uh, reduce the, the lead time. And that's one of the actual reasons why, why this 3D technology is used is first the lead time and second accessibility anywhere uh, remote or, or to, re to replace the parts. Uh, so with this technology, you can reduce the lead time from the uh, for design of new turbine blades to its production from, let's say, two years to two months. Yeah, so that just gives you an order of magnitude uh, what's possible. In the figure here, in A figure, you can see the S-built turbine, so the A figure. Um, and uh, there is already shows you very clear limitation of this technique. And the, the limitation is you probably could already guess is that uh, the surface inhomogeneities. Yes, the surface roughness of the finished product, it has certain uh, limitations. So it can be, if you optimize the process, it can be 20, about 20 microns. You can go lower with certain uh, remelting technologies. Uh, but this is your limitation. And, and this for sure could, especially for dynamic applications such as fatigue, where you have initiation of the surface of a tick crack, uh, this, is a, this is a limitation. No? And however, uh, there are uh, uh, common cross processes that are used uh, to finish. And uh, those can be machining, those can be certain etching, blasting techniques uh, to actually smoothen this all out. Also the internal channels uh, uh, to, to produce um, more mechanically resistant uh, blades. Um, and an example here, and this is what I like to, to, to show always, is that uh, you can really design complicated cooling channels with this kind of technologies. And uh, normally we work, for example, with, um, with software, with the, with the designers that uh, design based on the boundary conditions, the cooling channels, and we try to implement it in a component. Um, so this kind of uh, cooling channels would be very tricky or even not possible by conventional uh, metal processes, yeah? Uh, so, so the ability to build in internal structures and uh, internal design is definitely uh, one of, uh, of the key advantages. Uh, besides this, and this is something I'm going to just uh, dive for you uh, briefly into, is uh, that additive technology, and this is what we also see these days is developed, it offers you various ways you can uh, combine materials so you can grade the materials, yeah, so to, to tailor, really tailor properties on, on demand. Because normally when you have a component, especially such as turbine blade or an engine uh, component, um, it's not experiencing only one uh, mechanical constraint. Yeah, it's experiencing creep, fatigue, uh, corrosion. And you try to have the material that will have it all. But it's not necessary to have all, uh, to have it all at all locations. And what additive manufacturing is, is offering, it gives you, is that tailor and put materials, specific materials, specific material properties that require, for example, fatigue or require corrosion at the locations that they, that, uh, that they require this, this, uh, this performance, right? And this is what we call functionally grade materials. So we call this a composite materials where you can grade the composition, grade the microstructure, or you can also grade a combined multi-materials. So here's the example of um, of steel and copper, but there could be other for sure example of materials. Um, what we in our group we focused uh, on, and I, uh, and I like to share this with my students for sure, because this is something that uh, we have experience and I have more knowledge on, is how we can grade uh, the material with additive manufacturing technology and 
what is relevant for this course is uh, high temperature, super low in canal 718. And uh, we use powder. So this is an example of where you start the production of the, of the material with the powder. They have a certain range, 20 to 60 microns. It depends on the, on the supplier you get. And uh, you start melting it layer by layer. Uh, but my message here is that uh, what we, de we developed also in our uh, group uh, is with, um, with tailoring the process, process parameters. So with tailoring how much you apply uh, energy into the layer, yeah? Uh, what is the layer thickness? Um, do you apply the preheat on the, on the base plate on which you grow this all? You can grow different type of grains in the material. And you can do this locally anywhere in the component, yeah, by changing uh, the, the laser parameters, let's say. And this is an example of two distinctly different microstructures that, that we can control the grain growth, yeah? So this is uh, elongated along the build direction. This is 001 uh, orientation of grains. So you can see those elongated grains with 3D representation of the structure. And this is the equiates grains. And you can for sure can clearly see this kind of what they call a uh, fish, uh, fish eye structure. Yeah? So this is the melt pool. So this is how each layer is, is, is molten yeah? and, and put together. Um, and what, what can be done with additive technologies is uh, you can blend this kind of microstructures together. And in the next slide, I will, maybe some of you already can guess why you would like to have both in some locations, fine grain structure, yeah, in some locations, really this uh, 1001 orientation, yeah, so this is all red, what is shown here, this is one big grains, yeah, so elongated their own specific uh, location. And this is how the interface between the two layers uh, can look like. So this is just an example of how we can grow this, so tailor it in different locations, so in this in the middle you can see this one grains along this, uh, this orientation, this is all around is the fine grain matrix here. Yeah? Uh, so in as example, yeah, so this is the, uh, we call it EBSD map, it's not, it's not important for you guys, you know, material scientists, but what it allows you to show is the orientation of the grains, this technique. And you can see this, this all red is zero, zero, 001 orientation of the grain, uh, big grains, yeah, so they are millimeter scale, big, large grains. And this is a fine grain envelope, so kind of surrounded. So the concept that we applied here, uh, so for sure you have different properties. So you have uh, different strain, different hardness, different strengths, because the grain size controls this all as well and the grain orientation. But um, more importantly, what our concept with this uh, was is to tackle both fatigue and creep. Uh, properties in, for example, in tubular blades, because for fatigue, you normally, especially at the initiation, you want to have finer grains. Uh, so to, to have more grain boundaries that impede the initiation of your crack, yeah, so kind of uh, obstacles. While for creep, as, as we already discussed, you would like to have columnar or even, even single grains, and you would like to have this somehow in one envelope. So is that it in manufacturing? What my message is, is that you can get there, you can, you can combine these two. But for sure, uh, not everything is possible with just as process condition. And this is an example that with additive manufacturing, uh, you, you normally don't use it in as process state. So you apply post-process uh, heat treatments and there is a, in also in our group, we would deal with this kind of heat treatments, uh, but with application of uh, hot as a static pricing and what we call aging te uh, te techniques, you can get to the levels that are higher than the cast or, or even, even road material. Yeah, so you, in terms of the yield strength, you can get at high temperature to the properties of, um, of, the, of the road material and uh, elongation uh, even higher than that. Yeah, so that's, that's possible with additive technologies because normally one of the comments we get, well, there is a big drawback with additive technology is the reliability and repeatability, yeah? Uh, but with appropriate post-processing, you can get to a really good level uh, of properties and performance. 
So what is our, uh, uh, it's not only ours, so we were the ones, the first ones in five, six years ago that developed this, but now more and more uh, groups and uh, companies pick this approach up, is that uh, to start uh, not from the materials, not from the material approach, but from the approach of a component. So what are the boundary conditions uh, that are imposed on the component? What is the temperature distribution? What is the stress distribution? And with this respect, what type of material properties uh, you would like to have, for example, on the blade of the, uh, on the tip of the blade, on the base of the blade, on the core structure, yeah, and they could be different. So if you take a turbine jet engine blisk, you, you can have area, areas that would require more high impact resistance, uh, high fatigue resistance, or high creep resistance. So with, with additive technologies, you can use this as a puzzle, yeah, so you can put different, uh, microstructure different properties as a puzzle together to tackle what we call site-specific properties. And that's exactly what we, uh, we also did uh, with our components. So we developed this kind of shell core structure. Yeah? So that we have a shell and uh, envelopes surrounded by, by fine grains. Yeah? So as shown here, while the core has a single uh, elongated grains along 001 direction. And uh, with this, we kind of approached, so we looked in term mechanic fatigue. Uh, again, this is something that we will not cover with you guys, but this is a fluctuation of both stress and temperature. And we, we cycle temperature 350 to 650 and also the stress level, uh, something that you would experience in the, in the jet engine, for example, most extreme, so start and shut down, take off and landing. Um, and what we see is that we improve with this kind of technique twice we improve compared to the cast and road material, we improve twice the, the, the lifetime because of this kind of approach. Yeah, so we tackle both uh, the fatigue at the outside, so the initiation is uh, retarded, but once the crack initiated, most importantly, it, it propagates, uh, it has no driving force anymore because crack would tend to propagate in, in the direction perpendicular, uh, so in, in the direction perpendicular, so it was parallel to the, uh, to the load axis, yeah? And there's a, no kind of a driving force, uh, or it's slowed down, so it, it's crack arrest that happens in the interface uh, with this uh, approach. So this is uh, just uh, something that I thought it's might be interesting for you for this course for you guys to know that what kind of uh, newer developments in, in additive technology happen. Besides this, what I mentioned is uh, a lot is going on on developments um, of, uh, of printing pure single crystal alloys, uh, not with the selective, uh, what we call it with, with laser, but with electron beam. So there's much larger heat volumes that are applied. And uh, a lot is going on also with uh, ceramic and intermetallic printing of, uh, for engine components and for turbine blade. Looking at the time, uh, guys, I would like to just, as I promise you for this lecture, to, to finish off with a few examples of, um, of oxide uh, per strengthened alloys. Uh, um, and those are produced by what we call mechanically alloying oxide dispersed strengthening. And uh, normally you will see the abbreviation on the alloys, so MA, yeah, so the mechanical alloying or ODS. Mechanical alloying is again, it's a powder metallurgical route. Uh, you can imagine that you can have a lot of blends of powders put together. Uh, they put in, in, in high capacity energy mills and they blend it together at a really high energy. And this leads to really homogeneous and fine grain structure of the particles. But uh, uh, more importantly, with this kind of technologies, you can blend in much more of this kind of uh, gamma primer. So you see this gamma primer, so these dark areas, uh, up to 55 to 75% of gamma primers with these technologies you can add into your material, which is not possible with, with more conventional techniques. Uh, but what's, uh, the, the other approaches that are done is, uh, is, is oxide dispersed strengthening. So yttria oxide, so this is, uh, you see this yttria oxide that is also added into this, into this mixture. 
And there you can see these dark particles, uh, also submicron, really submicrons. So look at the scale, we are really zoomed in. Yeah? Um, and they used especially to, to tackle uh, higher temperatures uh, properties. And an example is uh, shown here. Uh, so you see here a, uh, an example uh, of uh, rupture time, so thousand uh, rupture time of alloy. And uh, up to 900 degrees C, you see that directionally solidified, so convention, what we saw, a single grain of directionally solidified uh, alloys, uh, not mechanically alloyed, not oxide dispersed strengthened, they are superior. And, uh, and the reason is because they, are the, they contain gamma primes, so they are the, the, they are the strengthening phase there, up to 900 degrees. What happens after 900 uh, degrees is that you have um, uh, coarsening or dissolution of gamma prime. So with the temperatures above 900 degrees C, uh, if, uh, if the alloys are, and are used for this kind of temperature applications, uh, and we also see this kind of alloys actually also used for nuclear applications. Uh, uh, the yttria oxide dispersed transient alloys then are used. Yeah, so they do not show this kind of deterioration of properties. Um, and uh, the reason is for sure the yttria has a much larger uh, melting temperature, so it doesn't dissolve or coarsen at, at, at this kind of temperatures. And um, also, what we will cover in, in the creep, there is a different creep mechanism because of. Um, uh, the interaction of uh, dislocation with uh, yttria oxide. So the dislocations do not interact anymore only with ga gamma primes, as we discussed about these rafting structures. They also now have to interact with a lot of this tiny dispersed ceramic-like, yeah, so yttria oxide, uh, ceramic-like tough uh, particles. And this increases uh, the resistance and also increases the creep uh, with ODS alloys. So with this, um, well, just a few slides, we just be behind on time. Is uh, uh, another example is uh, for sure ceramic matrix composites. And there are two main types is uh, silica carbide, so silicon carbide and silicon carbide fibers or alumina with uh, alumina fibers. And uh, they for sure at uh, high strengths. But uh, what is important and what is very tricky with this kind of uh, carbides is the uh, interface properties. Yeah, so they have to be not too strong, uh, but not too weak. Yeah, so that allow that the crack actually goes around the interface uh, along these fibers. So it's not it's not that uh, that easy, um, and uh, for sure, yeah, the, the toughness resistance this is something that also needs to be considered. Uh, with this, we kind of uh, finalized this lecture uh, with you guys. And to recap, we looked into uh, different type of, uh, of materials that can be used historically, starting from uh, really wrought alloys yeah, to conventionally, more directionally solidified to single crystal. We also covered with you additive manufacturing really briefly, but if you have questions, uh, just feel free to, to ask, email me, uh, you have email on the first slide. Um, then we looked also into the what happens inside the nickel-based super alloys, yeah, so gamma prime, uh, or the, the strengthening, this rafting structure, and we looked into more uh, newer technologies, about the metallurgical routes, so, si such as uh, oxide dispersed strengthening alloys. In the next lecture, I will start with you guys with uh, thermal barrier coatings. I think it's important that you're also aware of this uh, concept briefly. And then we dive more in depth into failure uh, creep and uh, I'll, I'll try to leave br briefly cover the high temperature fatigue. Okay, uh, with this, we finish uh, the lecture. It's always difficult for me uh, not seeing your faces to see how many of you actually are still here. I see uh, most of you are still here. Thank you for joining uh, us today. I will now stop the, the recording and uh,